Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dan Porterfield from the Aspen Institute. We're here today to celebrate the launch of the much anticipated new book entitled The Future of Building Wealth, Brief Essays on the Best Ideas to Build Wealth for Everyone. Edited by my colleague, Ida Rademacher and Ray Bashara, the book is the culmination of a year long collaboration between the Aspen Institute's financial security program, which Ida leads, and the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. I'd like to acknowledge the contributions also of the Institute's Catherine Lucas McKay, Genevieve Melford, Karen Biddle Andres, as well as Joanna Smith Romani, who has been a leader on this project and all of our work around wealth equity since its inception. The book has breadth and depth with 63 original essays, more than 100 authors and contributors from many sectors, disciplines, zip codes, uh, and ideological perspectives. I thank and grant the team uh, and congratulate the team that made it all happen, including those I just mentioned, as well as Elizabeth Viverito, Emmy Urban, and the entire financial security program of the Institute. Uh, the Aspen Institute's purpose overall is to promote a free, just, and equitable society. And for seven decades now, we've driven change through inclusive dialogue, evidence-based inquiry, impactful ideas, practical uh, roll up the sleeves, problem solving, and engagement with leaders from all sectors and communities. Our method is to bring together citizens and thinkers and change makers with diverse political beliefs, worldviews, life histories, cultures, and convictions, and then catalyze action that makes a difference. Well, as we all know, uh, right now our country faces an historic level of economic and racial inequality that has the potential to crater our economy and our democracy, unless we together show the will, the skill, and the civic imagination to meet the moment. I think the book represents an effort to do just that, to meet the moment. The ideas contained here will help us close racial and gender wealth gaps, reimagine how we pay for post-secondary education, an essential investment in the people of our country and our collective future, will help us bring stakeholder and community voice into key decision-making about financial inclusion, ensure that there's equity and opportunity for people with disabilities in our financial systems, something that has not been thought about enough uh, over the years and the decades, will help us to use technology to strengthen family finances, a critical area of priority at the Institute and in society, and so much more. In partnership with the St. Louis Federal Reserve and scores of authors and institutions included in these pages, we seek to spark that critical national conversation, meeting the moment that leads to solutions. And it's also been a tremendous experience to partner with the extraordinary team at the St. Louis Federal Reserve on this project. I'd now like to invite President Jim Bullard to offer his thoughts before we hear from Ida, Ray, and several of our authors. Uh, President Bullard. Thanks so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I wanna thank uh, Dan Porterfield for uh, his introduction and for organizing today's exciting book launch event. The St. Louis Fed is proud to partner with the Aspen Institute for this book on building wealth inclusively. When Ray approached us uh, uh, with the idea for this book, we thought, what a great way to keep Ray busy. But seriously, like Ray, the St. Louis Fed believes that the confluence of so many large events makes this book especially timely. The pandemic, the recession that followed, and our nation's critical efforts around racial reckoning. And all of these are occurring amidst levels of economic inequality our nation hasn't seen in a century. These are precisely the kinds of events that present opportunities to update our country's social contract. We didn't want to miss our chance to put some bold and innovative ideas on the table. While it's not the Fed's role to direct fiscal policy, it is our role as thought leaders in macroeconomic policy, economic research, economic education, and community development to offer fact-based ideas that could improve our nation's economy, especially for those struggling Americans who could more fully reap 
its rewards. Thought leadership has always been central to St. Louis, the St. Louis Fed's mission. And we were eager to provide leadership in an area where we were already heavily invested, savings and wealth building among those with fewer resources. Through our recently sunset Center for Household Financial Stability, founded in the wake of the Great Recession, we documented large and enduring wealth gaps along racial, educational, generational, and gender lines. These gaps, as the opening essays in the book demonstrate, remain large and enduring. The top 10% of American families own 70% of total financial wealth, while the bottom half owns only 2%. Those in the top half of the wealth distribution are more likely to be older, white, or highly educated. These groups own more family wealth than their share of the population. The bottom half is disproportionately younger, black or Hispanic, and less educated. These groups own less family wealth than their share of the population. In many ways, we see this book as a capstone of the center's efforts to promote wealth building inclusively, but we also see it as a cornerstone of the center's successor, the Institute for Economic Equity, which views wealth equity as critical to achieving overall economic equity in our country. Obviously, we have a long way to go to reach wealth equity. For example, the typical or median white family has a net worth of about $184,000, while the typical black family has just $23,000. Think about what these different levels mean for a family's economic resilience in the face of job loss, uh, car breakdown, or natural disaster, or for a family's abilities to look ahead to invest in education, a small business, a first home, or a secure retirement. We all know that wealth begets wealth, so the challenge is how do you accumulate some wealth in the first place? Answering that question is one of the reasons we're eager to publish this book. The book aims to document profound wealth gaps, but also point toward some promising solutions. Knowing that we don't have all the answers, Ray and Aspen reached out to over a hundred diverse and leading experts resulting in over 60 original essays. These essays not only offer the latest thinking on ways to shore up fragile family balance sheets, but also how to devise entirely new ways of generating an ownership stake in the US economy. Importantly, working toward wealth equity at the household level contributes to a stronger overall economy. This point was strongly reinforced in a conversation I had with three of my Fed colleagues Presidents Bosick of the Atlanta Fed, Harker of the Philadelphia Fed, and Kashkari of the Minneapolis Fed, a summary of which is included in this book. In that discussion, my colleagues also described how the Fed could help address racial and other wealth gaps using the tools at its disposal. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you'll pick up your free copy, The Price is Right, of the book and especially engage in the conversations, uh, we're sure it will start. I'm now pleased to turn the program over to the book's co-editors, my colleague, Ray Bashara, along with Ida Rademacher of the Aspen Institute. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for those remarks, uh, President Bullard. And I love that this was actually just a project to keep Ray busy. Um, <laughs> I actually imagine Ray is very busy and didn't need the addition of this project, but um, what an enormous achievement it's been to pull it all together. So my name is Joanna smith Romani. I'm the Managing Director of the Financial Security Program, have been working with Ida, Ray, and the team on this book and also an emerging future wealth portfolio that we have, and it is my great pleasure to kick off the conversation with the two editors 
and the sort of hearts behind this project, Ida and Ray. Um, for those of you that haven't seen me since November, this is the second time I've worn a blazer since November. That's how important <laughs> the last time was when we kicked off our financial security framework um, and our five-year anniversary for FSP, where one of the key pieces we had in it was actually about reimagining wealth and ownership. So how satisfying that now fast forward to less than a year later and in partnership with the St. Louis Fed, a set of really amazing authors that we've got this, like a whole book to get us super excited about the directions to go to reimagine it. Um, but there's a good origin story here and it matters to how we understand where to take it. So Ida, tell us a little bit about like, what, what about this book? Why, why are we doing this? Where did it come from? And then Ray, please like chime in and let's just get the conversation going. Thanks, Joanna. Your blazer looks amazing. Yeah. Uh, and, and we'll discuss whether Ray's busy enough or not later. I have a, <laughs> a whole new list now that the book is done to take care of it. Look, the origin story for the book is one uh, that we're going to tell over and over uh, because I think that there's, uh, there's a long story and there's a short one. Um, Ray, I'll start it and I'll, I'll tag team it over to you. You know, I think the reality is when, when I came to FSP, the Financial Security Program in Aspen, God, almost seven years ago now, part of what I wrote about at the beginning were the tensions uh, that were really at the heart of the assets field at the time, which were that we had a lot of focus on wealth creation at a time when the economy had changed and the financial fragility of households had changed. And we were a little bit tone deaf in terms of our aspirations for wealth without recognizing what was happening with income volatility and debt and the erosion of wages. And so we took a minute, you know, okay, maybe two or three years to really double down on what is real in households today. But we never wanted to stop at a goal of helping households manage scarcity. That wasn't, that wasn't where we wanted to go. And so really about three years ago in Aspen, uh, during a series of conversations around the future of wealth and ownership, we started to get ambitious about the story we needed to reimagine and retell about this work. And uh, we didn't do it alone. Uh, we never do it alone. Aspen's really a platform for others in that space. But uh, it, it really accelerated last year and last summer. And that's where I'll let Ray take over the story. Uh, thank you, Joe. Thank you, Ida. I should just point out that it wasn't just President Bullard that wanted to keep me busy. It was my wife who was stuck <laughs> with me at home. Uh, <laughs> oh my goodness. After, yeah, and after a lot of Zoom calls, she sent me to the basement. So I was very busy down there working on the book. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody. It's just, it's great to be here. I'm sorry we're not in person as we had envisioned, yeah. but it's nonetheless just really exciting to be here. I congratulate Aspen on starting this discussion on the future of building wealth a few years ago. And, um, you know, when, as, as President Buller mentioned, we were in this moment of COVID, racial equity, a recession, uh, record inequality. And, I, you know, we were thinking, like, what do we do with this moment, this unique moment that we have? Yeah. And so Ida and I convened a small group, a small brain trust, which informally became uh, the Wednesday Wealth Working Group. We had no agendas, just a bunch of Zoom calls that included Jennifer Tesher, Tim Flocka, Dorothy Brown, Ed Civic, and Derek Hamilton, many of them contributing to the book yeah, itself. In the book, right? Yeah, yeah. And so we just like, like, what do we do? What's going on? What do we make of this moment? I think, I think what we realized is that COVID, racial equity, inequality, the recession, we're all threats to family finances and certainly to family wealth. Um, and we were concerned about that, of course, but we also thought, well, this really could be an opportunity you know, not just to restore family balance sheets, many of which had not even fully recovered from the Great Recession. Right. But, you know, so how do, we, how do we level set with family balance sheets, but more importantly, even to um, even reimagine how families generate an ownership stake in this country. Yep. So that, that's really, and we thought a book is the best way to do it. I'm stuck at home. All these authors are stuck at home. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone know, needs just, to be busy right now. Well, Everyone needs yeah, something yeah, to I do. Had to, I had to keep myself busy and a lot of other people busy. Yeah. And I hope, I hope that was all constructive for everybody. But that, that's, um, you know, that, that's really kind of the origins of the book. Yeah, well, I mean, for the three of us and for almost all of the authors in the book, this has been our career's work. And mm -hmm. as Ida mentioned, you know, we've, we've shifted to what are the short-term financial needs and pains of families and kind of spent 
not too much time there, but then lost the plot a little bit about what is the what is really financial security and where is wealth and ownership fit in. Um, so it's exciting to see the range of solutions in this book. And I'm wondering for you guys, like you talked a little bit already, Ray, about this moment we're in. I mean, everyone's heard that so much between the pandemic, the racial reckoning, um, the commitments that corporate and private philanthropy and corporations have been making around these issues, just like get us all excited. I mean, the point of this event and the point of this book is to bring people into this, right? The three of us, the people on this call, the contributors to the book will not solve this by ourselves. And to do that, we've got to get people excited that like this is possible, but also this is now. Like this is the time to do it and we cannot waste this opportunity. And I'm wondering, Ray, like what's your perspective on that? What's your sense of the like, the this is the now we need all 700 people on this call to do something about this? Yeah, I, thank you. Thank you, Joe. I, I, you know, let me, let me just underscore that even though we feature over a hundred authors in 63 uh, essays and Fed presidents talking about this issue, um, it, this is really a down payment on a larger discussion, Absolutely. and we want to engage others because we really are in a unique moment, not just historically in terms of, you know, COVID and inequality and racial equity, but as I wrote in a previous book, um, we're in one of those rare moments to update the social contract, mm -hmm. as President Bullard mentioned, and, you know, to do that, we need experimentation, we need new ideas, we need thought leadership, we need folks coming together, and we're hoping the book can, can start that conversation. Yeah. And so, you know, new you know, ideas that ultimately become policy have their roots in communities and states and, 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 you know, in books. And, you know, we're hoping that we can be a catalyst in helping to update our social contract with regards to family financial security. So we think this book is important now uh, for that reason, too. Yeah, and it takes all those things and courage and bravery and leadership, right? And Ida, what would you add there? I mean, I know for you, this isn't just a like a passion project because it's been your career's work, but you fundamentally, you know, believe and know and the evidence tells us and families tell us this is the thing that matters. But why as the executive director of our program, did you say this is the thing that we need to spend our capacity and resources on and fundraise towards right now? Yeah, look, I, I think what's at stake, the inflection point we're at as a country is uh, one we need to, it can't, fall off the front page just because we've forgotten how fraught things were a year ago. I mean, and, and, and I can't, I, I, of course people haven't forgotten, but there is a way that things shift. And there was, if you can remember, part of the reason I think why now is um, an imperative is there is, you know, McKinsey, others have sized uh, $200 billion worth of new commitments to racial equity and to closing the racial wealth gap in the last in the last year. And there's a little bit of an opportunity here as people are leaning into this issue, corporate leadership, new philanthropic dollars, new private donors in this space uh, to make sure that as we start to say, we can do this, this is a solvable problem that we are really holding ourselves accountable to put out the range of solutions and the kinds of ideas that can ignite and spark this forward. Yeah. Uh, there obviously needs to be an evidence base around each solution. And you know, our goal with the book this time was not that everything in there has already had a randomized control tile, right. Uh, trial, right? But the idea is that there is a whole new generation of leaders coming from uh, surprising places that are naming this as the issue, that are putting new ideas about how to, how to own in ways that are de-risked, in ways that are powerful. And our goal at Aspen is to be the big tent, you know, before right. we all get set on one right new silver bullet on this, let's have the conversation as a country about what it's really gonna take to yeah. build wealth inclusively in this country. And the exciting part is that that's a conversation we can all get behind. So um, yeah, that's, that's right. And we need to be bold in our ideas. And in fact, our team will be working on a scan of solutions that again, aren't rigorously tested yet, but are promising and matter to sort of be a, the next step of this book. And we're really excited about it. I am sad, we have to wrap up. Me and my blazer have to hit the road so the like rest of the content can get to you all. Um, but really quickly, Ray, if there's like one thing, and we're going to get to this at the end, so you don't have to say it all now too, but like, 
let's just tease folks of the thing we're inviting them, asking them, corralling them to do. What's the thing for you that you want folks to have in the back of their mind as they're engaging in this conversation? That we all have a role to reimagine how families move forward in this economy, how they build resilience. This book is a down payment. We have blogs, we envision a roadshow and roundtables. Read the book, reach out to us. We're very eager for this book to start a conversation, not end it. Yeah, thank you. And Ida, any last words before I turn it over to Ray for our next segment? Thanks everybody for joining us. And uh, it's really just the beginning. So, uh, and it's such an exciting, optimistic, hopeful beginning. So everyone enjoy the rest of the event today. Thank you for joining us. Ray, take it over for me. <laughs> Well, this is very brief. Uh, I'm simply going to point out that we also had videos uh, from some contributors who uh, we're going to show throughout the program today. And right now, I'm very eager to turn it over to the first one of those, John Rogers of Aerial Investments. John, great to see you. Thank you so much for participating in this launch event. Great to see you too. Yeah, thank you. You know, when we first had the idea for this book, you were one of the first people we reached out to. You've, you've been a real pioneer and innovator in the investment community and the DEI community, of course. And I'm just eager for folks to hear more about the, the exciting idea that you and Professor Creary have, have, have included in our book. So I have a few questions. Uh, uh, anything else you want to say by way of introduction? Well, I would just say, as you know, I'm so extraordinarily impressed with your research. I still remember reading about it and then getting in touch with you and not a day goes by that I don't quote some data from all the work you've done. And so you've made such an extraordinary contribution to our country. It's so important, especially around these critical issues. Thank you. We, we really appreciate that, John. That's a very, very kind compliment. Thank you very much. So, um, Let's talk about let's talk about your essay. So you and Professor uh, Creary, you, you focus on uh, starting with you to grow the number of black investors uh, in the stock market. And um, so what you know, what's the importance of of having more black investors and, and why should we start with you? Well, as we know, um, you know, building wealth through the stock market is something that's been a tried and true winning strategy in our country. And all the data shows that African-Americans have been underinvested in the markets, not comfortable in the markets, not trusting the markets. As we know, African-Americans have not been able to create the kind of wealth that means that you don't ultimately have a wealth advisor, because if you don't have a lot of money, you don't have to get into the financial markets. But it's become critically important in today's society as, as 401k plans have replaced traditional pension plans. So if you're not comfortable in the markets, it's going to have profound, it will have a profound impact on your ability to retire comfortably. And we think that's critical. So one of the things, as you know, I learned from my dad when I was 12 years old, every birthday and every Christmas after that age, he bought me stocks instead of toys. And, you know, it wasn't fun going to the Christmas tree and, and getting a stock certificate in the beginning, <laughs> but I fell in love with the markets. And so I, I, my idea was that, you know, we need to get young people to be able to get the same kind of exposure that my dad gave me. And he's been sort of my inspiration mm -hmm. for this. And so it's so critical to get public schools to teach kids about the stock market uh, and get them started at an early age so they can be very comfortable fully participating. Sure. Yeah. And I do want to talk a little bit more about, about the uh, Ariel Academy in a minute. But just before we do that, John, tell me. You know, the, the common response uh, around uh, growing black wealth re really revolves around going to college and buying a home. And I, I know you think those are important, but what, so what, how do, how do you situate these three asset strategies together, buying a home, going to college and, and investing in the stock, stock market? And why, why is the stock market particularly important? Well, as you know, and your research shows that, you know, college education is just not good enough to be able to help solve this wealth gap. You know, it's still going the wrong way, even with college educated African-Americans. And that we know because of historic discrimination in this country and some of the uh, restrictive covenants in various communities, buying a home can't always be the answer because too often we are relegated to buying homes in parts of urban communities that are not growing and real wealth is not being accumulated for the African-American African families. So the stock market is one place where the, whether you're black or brown or white, you're gonna be treated 
equally if you get involved and engaged in investing in really, really good companies. So we think the equity markets are a should be a traditional anchor uh, for teaching kids about saving and investing. And often it isn't. Two people just always default to the home is most important. Uh, people talk about getting savings bonds. But we know over the next 30 years, the equity markets will crush uh, the bond market. And that's been our traditional uh, fact in this country. So we've got to get people to understand that and get out of this comfort zone, which hasn't created wealth for our communities. So you mentioned 529 college savings accounts. As you know, I'm a big fan of getting those started early in life. And you and Professor Creary mentioned the, the New York City uh, Kids Rise program. So why, what do 529s, what's their role in this bigger scheme of getting more minority investors? Well, what I, I love about the New York City Rise program is that they're putting the money not only into a, a 529, but they're putting it into the equity portion of a 529, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. compound interest over the long run. And mm -hmm. you know, it's so great that our, our country has you know, incentivized uh, young people to be able to put money away, have tax advantages of putting money into a 529 program, be able to find various diverse mutual funds to invest the money in. It's, it's really a, it's just a terrific, uh, terrific idea. And again, too mm -hmm. many well-meaning programs are just fixated on fixed income and money market funds and savings bonds and not allowing the kind of growth that a 529 plan allows you if you pick active mm -hmm. equity opportunities and just trust the markets. You know, Warren Buffett always reminds us that last century, the Dow Jones started at 66 and ended at over 11,000. We had two world wars, a Great Depression, uh, war in Vietnam, you know, a pandemic, you go on and on and the market steadily marches higher. We need to get young people to understand that in particular young people of color to get that kind of exposure and that kind of understanding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great, that's exciting. Well, I'm particularly excited about these programs that make that the default option that you are born with an investment account in your name and you can have it for life. And I, I just think that's a really critical feature that you and Professor Creary highlight in your essay. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm, we're going to transition now and we'll have another couple of those snippets from authors and, and you all should know that we're we we'll have a 10 week campaign and by the time we're done, we will feature every author in the book, every essay in the book and the ideas in it. So again, today is just a down payment on the conversations, but I'm very lucky to start that down payment with three of the authors in the book. So uh, uh, Romy, come on come on camera. Uh, we've got uh, Romy Parzik, who is the CEO of Vault. Uh, uh, we've got Ed Sivak, who is the Executive Vice President of Hope uh, Credit Union, and Vanessa Perry, who is a professor in the management uh, school at GW. I might have just butchered that, Vanessa. I'm sorry. I'll let you all uh, take the first step. You're going to see in a minute why we decided this was the right opening kind of grouping of, of folks, but let me turn it to each of you to just introduce yourselves and a little bit of the uh, personal or professional reason that you focus on issues of wealth and, and, and debt, really balance sheet issues for households and the ways they acquire them. Uh, Romy, I'll start with you. Hi. Hi, how are you, Ida? Great. Thank you everybody for having me today. Um, so I'm Romy Parzik, I'm CEO of Vault. We're a student loan benefits provider based out of Austin, Texas. Um, I'm a first generation immigrant. So I came when I was a year old with my parents and um, we have really been able to sort of live the American dream. And I think that um, because of that experience, I have been really passionate about um, serving low to moderate income communities um, and helping bridge the uh, sort of racial wealth divide for, for folks. Um, my career is, you know, I've done work at large CDFIs like self-help. I've worked at the Financial Health Network and now my startup focuses um, really on helping employers um, attract and retain top talent, um, especially, especially diverse talent. Um, so really glad to be here and, and excited about the, the book, which just arrived momentarily at my doorstep, which is fantastic. So thank you, Ida. Thanks so much. Vanessa, you want to go next? Welcome. Sh sure. Thanks. I'm so pleased to be here and pleased to be part of this effort. 
I'm Vanessa Perry. I am a professor uh, in the School of Business at the George Washington University School of Business. Uh, I am also a non-resident fellow at the Urban Institute's Center for Housing Finance Policy and Housing Finance Policy Center. And uh, for the bulk of my career, I have studied issues related to access to housing and uh, home ownership, especially for disadvantaged minority groups, Black and uh, Latinx households. I came to study these issues. I uh, started out way back when, when I worked at Freddie Mac and was astonished at the sort of lack of real depth of understanding at the public policy level of the antecedents and consequences of, of the gaps in, in home ownership and access to these opportunities. So here I am. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you had the time to start to unpack some of that in this essay, but I know it's the tip of the iceberg of your scholarship. So thanks for joining us. Uh, and Ed Sivak, my friend, please introduce yourself, but maybe leave out the stories about 20 years ago when you were trying to keep me from getting hopelessly lost in the Delta when I was evaluating your loan programs. No, thanks, Ida. It's great to be here with everyone today. Um, and so Ida, you know, she set it up right. You know, I've been with Hope Credit Union now for 20 years. I had the good fortune to be invited back after an internship. Um, and, you know, just a little bit on HOPE, you know, HOPE is a Black and women-owned uh, credit union. We have about 36,000 members uh, situated here in the deep south states of Arkansas, Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Tennessee. And beyond just being a credit union, we really see ourselves as a civil rights organization. We exist to mitigate the extent to which factors such as race or gender or wealth or place of birth stand in the way of, of anyone from achieving economic prosperity in, in this country. Um, and so, um, again, uh, started here many years ago, I've been uh, at the CDFI the, the entire time. Um, and hope is a way of life. Um, outside of hope, I have also the good fortune of being involved with our local school board here in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, again, recognizing that, that, that strategies to build individual wealth are important and community wealth has the ability to accelerate or extract uh, from those depending on how they shake out. So thanks, Ida. No, this is great. So the book uh, has a pretty ambitious scope. Uh, it, and and we've, we've, we've teed this up as well when we did our financial security 2020 uh, paper last year, which is there are some pretty clear pathways through which most households in America who have wealth uh, have accumulated that wealth. And if you look at the survey of consumer finances or any of Ray's center's uh, work, that kind of the three headlines about where does wealth come from on a balance sheet uh, are from home equity, home ownership. Uh, they are from small business ownership. Uh, they're in retirement accounts. And, uh, and increasingly, uh, we know more about how those systems work but especially since COVID, we know a lot about how they don't work uh, uh, for uh, particular populations, for communities of color. So I would love for you all to say a little bit about the pathways that your work touches on um, and what you know about the ways that those traditional pathways uh, have not worked uh, for the households that we need to focus on if we're going to focus on an inclusive wealth agenda. Um, uh, Vanessa, let me start with you. We'll go. We'll go housing. We'll go kind of retirement education. We'll go. We'll go uh, into small business and, and community. Sure, sure. So we know that home ownership has been the most common vehicle for wealth accumulation in the U.S., but it's been less the case for Black and Brown households due to the legacy of racism and discrimination in access to mortgage credit and other systemic barriers in housing markets, you know, redlining that's led to, you know, persistent neighborhood racial segregation, differential of sort of inferior access to both public and private services, et cetera. And I think it's really important that we remember that our housing markets were, and, and our systems were designed intentionally to exclude people of color and women. They were designed specifically in a way that could minimize the participation of those groups in these markets. So as a result of these influences, 
these households have significantly lower rates of home ownership and have uh, over time lower returns to home ownership. That is fewer returns to home ownership. So um, black and Hispanic households, for example, experience lower rates of house price appreciation, the neighborhoods where they tend to live, which means lower, less equity accumulation. Uh, and in short, these historically disadvantaged households have missed out on many of the benefits that uh, homeownership actually provides. And I like what you're saying there because you're calling out a couple of dimensions. It's not just the initial access to a lump sum, a down payment, um, uh, access to credit, it is the broader appreciation process that also has disparities built into it. Yeah, um, absolutely. That has to be addressed. Great. Thank you for, for laying that out. How about, how about you, Rumi? Can you say a little bit about the kind of the, and I think in some ways it leads to, or it harkens back to what we just heard John Rogers talk about as well, which is this is around kind of what's going on with people's kind of access to stock markets, but also how does that connect to the debt that you, they see in their lives as they try to use education as, a, as, a, as an economic mobility strategy? Yes, it's absolutely so interconnected. And I think um, what Vanessa just said really builds directly into, into my points around student loans. So today we have 1.7 trillion outstanding, 45 million borrowers. That's poised to almost double to 3 trillion in 2027, by 2027. And fundamentally, it's, you know, there's lots of issues um, that have led to this confluence events, but really since the eighties, the cost to attend college has grown eight times faster than wages. So it's just difficult for most families really of many means across the spectrum to actually send a child to college without incurring costs, um, which we're seeing in the stats. 70% of four-year grads are graduating with about $37,000 in student loan debt. Now you add the racial and gender debt divide issues that Vanessa touched on and President Bullard touched on. So, you know, the sur survey of consumer finance um, the latest numbers, which President Bullard talked about, white families have a median, median wealth of 188,000. Um, compare that to black families at 24,000 and Hispanic families at 36,000. You, they, they don't have intergenerational wealth because of some of the, these home ownership issues, because of the, the, the broader systemic issues. And intergenerational wealth is what can help you go to school without incurring debt. And then they're also likely to earn less, uh, women and people of color to earn less than their white male peers over the course of their life. So then, you know, if 10 years out, they're less likely to be, um, have paid off their student loans at the rate that their white male peers might have paid off. Um, so it's really very in interconnected, all these issues and, and why the debt divide keeps growing. And let me switch, we'll come around next to kind of like, so what can we do about these issues? And I, I love the way that you've connected a couple of issues there, Romy. Ed, when we, I love the essay that you and Bill Bynum wrote for this because it, it doesn't just situate um, a wealth pathway, it situates in place. Um, uh, and so I wonder if you could share a little bit about kind of what you're seeing from the small business front, what you're seeing from the community uh, front around, around what, how has that pathway not worked the same for all communities? No, thanks, Ida. You know, I really um, want to just lift up uh, one of the points that uh, Dr. Perry raised, which, you know, she, she talked about how the housing markets have been designed to intentionally exclude people of color and women. And it's, it's really this notion of how things have been done by design. Um, in Dr. Perry's essay, you know, it, it, it's the outcomes are no accident. That could be the quote tweet of the day um, if you wanted to take something from this this panel. Um, you know, when Bill Bynum, our CEO, and I embarked on the essay, you know, we were charged by the editors to um, shine a light on the importance of community wealth building. So we used two case studies to kind of show both where gaps have occurred in the Mississippi Delta and the rural Alabama Black Belt, and then what could be done about it. Um, so that led us to tell the story of, of Eastmore, Mississippi. You know, Eastmore was a neighborhood development that was intentionally built on the other side of a town line and then where the homes were intentionally marketed to black residents to basically maintain a white majority to keep a white mayor in place in the Mississippi Delta as population demographic change was occurring. The homes were 
thrown up, slip shod. Um, you know, there were there were many problems over the years from sewage in the front yards to electrical fires to, and, and people lost property and people lost their lives in these homes. Um, and so you can imagine, you know, beyond that trauma, just what the overall um, wealth picture looked like, both for individuals, but then the spillover effect to the community. Um, Hope was invited into that community. Um, when we arrived in, in Moorhead, Mississippi, the mayor took Bill, our CEO, out there after Bill asked, what do you want? What do you need? And he said, you know, after he said, well, actually, we could use an ATM. There wasn't an ATM there in the community. And then he said, now, let me take you to Eastmore. And, and as we sat down and listened to the residents of Eastmore, they didn't they didn't ask for new homes. They asked for basic things a sidewalk without cracks so the elderly could visit their neighbors, a, a playground for the children. Um, but in that, we were, you know, we were also, we also recognized that if we could find a way to rebuild these homes to make them first safe, but then energy efficient to turn them into the wealth generators that home ownership is, that we know it to be, that the outcomes would far surpass that of, of, of anything else that, that we could do there. And, Again, through through the investment of many partners as a CDFI, we were able to do that. But again, it all started with that East, that, that community was built by design to exclude Black people from the um, wealth building uh, aspects of home ownership. But also just it was, it was an act of voter disenfranchisement, um, all done by design. You know, the other um, story we share is, is about uh, the Alabama Black Belt, where we were invited in, you know, when a group of black uh, state lawmakers said, you know, the recovery money is coming down uh, to our states, to to cities, to counties, but it's being put out there on a reimbursement basis. And so local governments in places that are growing, that have reserves, that have wealth, they could put the money out for coronavirus uh, prevention, for response. But those that were smaller or shrinking, like, frankly, black rural towns in the Alabama Black Belt, uh, they didn't have the money. They didn't have the cash to put up front to access the funds. Um, and again, it was only through a partnership with Hope and the Black Belt Foundation of Alabama, some corporate partners that, that put up funds to reserve uh, investments that Hope made into the Black Belt Foundation, which then made into the local governments that money was even able to get out in the first place. I mean, this, these were expenses that were literally designed to save lives but yet black communities were being excluded from just by the sheer design of the program. Um, so those are just a couple of, of, of ways that we see the community effects basically accelerating the extraction of wealth um, above and beyond um, when policy uh, reinforces exclusion. Yeah. Well, let's, let's go there a little bit now because I, I know that all of these should be, you know, in our wildest dreams, this book, lent itself to a big tent conference where we're all together and we have hours to go into these things. Today instead is gonna be a sampling, a snippet. So apologies if we move quickly, we miss things. The book is there, the conversations will continue. I wanna keep on the topic of design and Vanessa, thank you for raising it in this conversation. And also know that one of the first sections of the book is all about design, the design of systems and the unintentional and sometimes intentional consequences that have led to the kind of wealth gaps we see. Let's move into a, we get to play some kind of a, you know, man behind the curtain, uh, re-engineering of the design and look at uh, something that's more hopeful. I'm gonna, actually, I'm gonna start with Ed and kind of move back across and stay with that and Romy will end on you. Okay, so I'll come around the other way. Um, but Ed, I wonder, um, you've talked about the community issues you have seen firsthand as well in the pandemic, the way that the design of systems, policy systems, and kind of like the plumbing, as uh, Fred Goldberg used to say, uh, has ha, was was systematically unhelpful uh, to households. I, but you also have ideas about how to fix that. So I wonder if in a, in a quick way, could you say a little bit about um, the kind of design of systems that would equip your households and communities that you work with uh, to be in a better place five years from now. No, thanks, Ida. You know, we actually, our closing paragraph uh, of the essay that Bill and I wrote um, says, such conditions need not be predestined. And, you know, I think there's three things that we would like to lift up here. Um, you know, the, the first is um, we need to listen to community. Community knows what um, is needed, 
to 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 build wealth, to to put people in a place to achieve economic prosperity. If if, if we're not listening to local people, if we're not asking questions, we're never going to get to a place where we solve these problems. Uh, voice needs to be front and center in our solutions. Um, second, you know, we need to continue to lift up the role of community development financial institutions, of, of black owned, of Hispanic owned financial institutions and their role in building wealth. Um, you know, uh, black owned financial institutions are more likely to lend to black owned businesses. They're more likely to locate in black communities. They're more likely to lend to black people seeking a, a mortgage. The spillover effects from those are, are exponential because as we fund black businesses, as we actually provide the capital that is commensurate with demand and the capacity to grow, um, then uh, black owned businesses are more likely to hire black people. Um, so we get effects there as well. And we also know that while the wealth gap for black and white households is 10 to one or 11 to one, we know that for black owned for house for black owned business owners and white owned business owners, the gap shrinks to three to one. So not one to one, but much better. But it's only going to get there through access to capital. CDFIs are a, a way, particularly those with long track records of serving communities of color, of, of being in low income communities. They have the ability to accelerate the deployment of capital, but we need to make sure that our systems are aligned with funding those entities that, again, have proven time and time again to be there for black entrepreneurs, homeowners, and consumers. This happens when philanthropy funds CDFIs at levels that they fund on the coast where there is more wealth in places where there is less wealth. This happens when government aligns its resources to um, invest again in places that have been historically overlooked. This particularly includes rural places where we have majority populations of color, like the Mississippi Delta, and the Alabama Black Belt, along the, the border in the Rio Grande Valley, in native communities. Um, and it also means that the private sector as well needs to step up and recognize um, where its investment strategies uh, have widened the gaps um, and also be held to not just invest investment strategies that, that are debt related, but also equity that position these institutions to grow and thrive. Thanks, Ed. And there's there's a whole section in the book and, and a lot of really interesting new thinking about equity investing uh, and the kind of capital stack that really leads to kind of reverse engineering some of the systems that you've seen. So, so thank you for that. Vanessa, home ownership, too broken to fix? Where would you start with system reform? Does it have to be policy? Is it local? Is it is it federal? You know, where where would you help ground this as a solvable problem? Uh, so all of the above, um, and I think uh, really really um, thinking deeply about Ed's comments and some of the more specific practical things that could be done on a local level. I don't wanna discredit the many reforms and programs that have been put in place by the many, many very, very committed and de dedicated and smart advocates uh, who've been focused on this for a long time. But quite frankly, we haven't made very much progress. In fact, we might've actually gone backwards since the passage of the 1968 Fair Housing Act, which was supposed to prohibit discrimination. Frankly, I think we need to start from scratch. Um, and you know, people, talk about reparations, but one way reparations could sort of manifest themselves would be in redesigning a housing finance system that was intended to maximize opportunities for home ownership while managing risk. And if we were to start from scratch, pretty much anyone would agree that the system would look very different than it does now. Um, it was designed to exclude, as I've mentioned before and others have emphasized, and so we should redesign it that to include explicitly. Um, and so that would, um, I think that would go a long way to you know, closing these gaps and providing the kinds of uh, access to capital and one of the prongs of this wealth accumulation that we've been talking about. Lots more to come and, and thanks for all the work you've done on, on the housing front. Um, and helping think about, the, they're just not easy solutions. They're complex, but you, it's, it's the time to grapple with the complexity. I just think that, the, that that's what's real right now. Um, Romy, you, you've done that in the elegant <laughs> ways that you started to think about 
new solutions. I think the, the bigger frame I want to put on your redesign question is, you know, in many ways, your solution is a next generation benefit in the bundle of benefits that are often an invisible, what Mariko Chang in the book calls a wealth escalator, which is when you are in a job that is uh, providing benefits, uh, there are a whole bunch of ways that in addition to income, that that job uh, creates and sets up long-term financial security and manages risk for you. Um, say a little bit about how you took this traditional benefit of retirement combined with the new need to grapple with student loan debt and are thinking a little bit about how you fix those systems simultaneously. Sure. Um, so my co-author is um, someone that leads HR for Abbott Labs. And in 2018, Abbott Labs went to the IRS and said, we have all these really well-educated folks that are scientists and lab techs. And we're finding that they're not putting their money into our 401k and therefore they're not getting the match. And nationally, we see numbers as high as $24 billion in unused match dollars. So funds that are earmarked by corporations that aren't being put into individuals 401ks because the individual doesn't have that extra dollar to earn the match. And so Abbott Labs was really the um, force behind this idea that what if we tracked employee student loan payments and in their design specifically, if you make 2% contributions towards your student loan payments that Abbott Labs would actually match 5% into your 401k. And so you're helping someone stay on track to pay down their student loans and they're building wealth at the same time. And so our technology um, was able to uh, really automate the type of work that um, Abbott Labs first was really the creator of. Um, and, and we're really hopeful that, uh, you know, things that are in Congress right now, like Secure Act 2.0, that looks to modernize the retirement industry, um, will have provisions that allow something like um, the Abbott Labs private letter ruling to become broad uh, guidance for the industry. Thank you so much. I, I wanna give you all a lightning round wrap up question because we've got about three minutes left. Uh, and that is, uh, I asked you, I kind of forced you to say how you, would, how you would redesign, how you would think about design future. Are you hopeful? Are you optimistic? Um, about the possibilities of the future. Ray and I started by saying we thought that the book needed to happen because we needed to put under one big tent the possibilities because we thought that there was a moment right now when people are leaning into these issues and wanting to learn what could work. Are you optimistic about change? And if so, is there one thing that you think needs to happen or one audience that needs to be listening in that regard? And Romy, we'll start with you and we'll run back through backwards through the mix and we'll end up with you, Ed. I am optimistic. I, uh, you know, just last month, last month, the Dur Department of Education announced that they've put together a, a rulemaking committee to really look at all the programs that are in place that just aren't working, like public loan service, the public service loan forgiveness. So I see that as a positive step. Um, in at the end of 2020, due to the CARES Act, we got. Um, a tax advantage to really bring employers in towards paying up to 5250 per employee per year in student loan benefits that get a tax advantage, not only for the employer, but also for the employee. So I think more things like the SECURE Act provision that I talked about and this tax advantage um, by expanding Section 127 of the IRS ruling uh, allows the private sector to come in and also be part of the solution. Thanks, Vanessa. I too am optimistic, um, largely because of the energy and the focus I see among sort of millennials and Gen Z. They are much more focused, they're much more insistent about fairness, about um, diversity and inclusion and equity and leveraging technologies in new ways to sort of achieve these things. I feel good about them. Thanks. All right, Ed. All right, we'll go three for three. Yes, I, I'm optimistic. Um, and I, I'm optimistic though for two reasons. One is uh, we've seen Congress act and invest in CDFIs at historic levels um, and levels not, not seen at any other time since these entities have existed. This was to a recognition of their role in pandemic response, particularly in communities of color. 
Well, we've also seen the private sector, you know, step up and make commitments. I think it remains to be seen whether or not these are just blips on the radar or, or if they can be a trend. Uh, the point that I think in some ways, I actually think that changing demographics compel hopefulness. Um, if, if we are going to realize our potential as a society um, in a nation that's becoming more black and brown, um, then we will have to change to make systems more inclusive. Otherwise, we're, you know, the, the, we, the, the promise of our economy, the potential of it, um, it, it will be limited. Um, and, and so that, that's the other reason. Again, I think there's a, this, this also leads me to be hopeful that, that we can make these changes. Thanks to all of you. Thanks for the, the time you took to write original essays. Thanks for the time you spend every day in your day jobs. And I know that it goes well beyond that for you all. Um, uh, I'll wrap it up there, but I do think that this starts to lay out some of the, there's hope around reforming existing systems of wealth creation um, and thinking about it differently. And we'll transition uh, into the next panel that is really starting to think about um, new ways of thinking about wealth creation. And starting from the beginning, here's a novel idea by design. So thank you all very much. I'll ask you all to turn off your cameras and uh, for a really quick segue into the next, I'm gonna hand it over to Ray in a minute. Uh, he's gonna come on with the second panel. But in between, I also got an opportunity uh, last week to talk with another author uh, from the book. Uh, he was one of five authors for the piece that he wrote about. Uh, but Dr. Uh, Yakov Fagan from the Berggruen Institute, who leads their uh, Future of Capitalism work. Uh, the way that the snippet uh, gets set up, there's not a lot of intro to either him or me, but we really wanted to get to the idea, which is around data as an asset, data as a wealth creation opportunity for uh, shared inclusive wealth. So let me turn it over to that clip, and then Ray will come on with the next panel. Thanks very much. You've taken the idea of the commodification uh, of, of wealth and applied it to a digital era. And so the, the chapter in the book is From My Data to Our Data, a proposal to equitably distribute wealth in a digital economy. Even that is still only a page and a half essay, but I'm gonna ask you to distill it even further today and just give us the pith of the issue or the opportunity for shared wealth that you propose in the book? Sure. So our essay, and I wrote this with several co-authors who helped me put together a larger report with the Berggruen Institute, is in response to this idea that there is a lot of wealth being created out of the commodification of information, particularly personal information. And the question is, how do we get around the equitable distribution of this, especially before it becomes commodified in law in a way that benefits a small amount of people, because we're still at the start of this process. There, is still, there are still so many unknowns on what the evolution of this will be. And our goal is to evolve it in an equitable way, but also in a way that fosters the productive use of this rather than the speculative use of this. And to get at that, we think that many we have to redefine the problem of wealth, as I mentioned before, in a way that gets out of it as an individual phenomenon, as a distribution of a commons, of a social surplus. And I, we think data is particularly useful to think through that problem because my data or your data is practically worthless. You can't really get an inference from an individual data point without comparing it to larger data, a larger data set of others, which means that implicitly this is a social good and that individual distribution mechanisms from this social good, let's say like a data basic income, for example, that somehow quantifies your particular personal data and gives you a check, you know, that's not maybe terrible, but it's not really addressing the problem at its core. So we came up with a way of making this into a commons via a set of taxation and institutional reforms. So in, in short, when we think about What's the takeaway right now for somebody who's just getting up to speed? I mean, everything at this book goes from everything that we already know about wealth creation in terms of home ownership and you know, business ownership, all sorts of things, to these cutting edge new ideas like what you were saying, which is uh, the next frontier of 
uh, value creation uh, in, this, in this economy will be around the value created by data. That value is co-created mm -hmm. uh, both by the companies who help to collect it and by all of the individuals whose actual lived experience creates that data. We should be thinking at the front end versus the back end of that conversation about who benefits from the, the way that that data is collected, shared, and, and try to head off monopolies um, and complete privatization of that process before there's a public conversation. Am I getting to the gist of it? That's absolutely right. Right. So lots of work to come on that. Uh, Bergruen Institute has a, a lot of deep work in that report and, uh, and the snippet part is in the book. So thank you very much for contributing to the book and thanks for some of your time today. Thank you so much for having me. And just quickly, if I could shout out that this is a co-authored piece and there are many people who came together to put their heads together to come up with these questions and solutions. So thank you very much also. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Waiting for my co-panelists to join. Wole, Allison, and Mark. Hey, Wole. Hey, Mark. Allison, there you are. Good to see you guys again. Thank you so much for your contributions to the book. Um, before we get started, um, I just want to make a very brief comment on the last panel that I think underscores some really critical aspects of this book. Um, both um, Ed and Vanessa, in particular, talked about um, families being and communities being deliberately excluded um, you know, by design. We have an entire section of the book called Equity and Inclusion by Design. So we really wanted to point out that this, this, this underscores the entire way we thought about the book. The second thing that I think um, Ed and, and, uh, uh, and Romy illustrated is that we're trying to break down silos in this book as well. So Ed is breaking down the silo between family and community wealth and Romy between student loans and retirement security. So I just wanted to make that point. And let's turn now to our panel. As Ida said that we, uh, you know, we're really trying to highlight some of the innovative ways that families can generate an ownership stake in this economy. Um, and, you know, we have a lot of folks who are thinking and writing about that in the book, and I hope you read them all, but we have three of them today that we're quite eager to highlight. First is Mark Fife of uh, Brown University. Second is Wole Coxum of Mobility Capital Finance. And third is Allison Schrager of the Manhattan Institute. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna pose a question and I would like each of you as you respond just to say a little bit more about yourself and the kind of work that you do. So the leading question here is um, why is it important to increase financial and investor inclusion if we'd like to build wealth more inclusively. Okay, uh, Wally, can uh, we begin with you? Absolutely, thanks so much, Ray, um, for including me in the, in the entire project and, and in this panel in particular. So quick background about me. So my name is Wally Koch, I'm founder of uh, Mobility Capital Finance, which we affectionately call MochaFi, and I spent 20 some odd years at Citigroup and Willis and JP Morgan, all really great organizations and gave me a good overview of financial services and had my George Floyd moment at the death of Michael Brown, uh, really thinking about how can I be a part of the conversation to bring real solutions to close the racial wealth gap in this country. And I decided that MochaFi is an entrepreneur uh, building a neobank uh, that with that focus would, would, would be my way of contributing to the conversation, really getting to the heart of your question, right? Which is how do you create a situation where all boats rise, right? And if we're able to bring more people into the financial mainstream with products and services that are geared towards that particular uh, cohort of individuals, we have an opportunity to create a more robust economy. I think some of the McKinsey studies would suggest that there's three to five trillion dollars of wealth that's available that can be created if uh, the African American community, for example, was as fully banked as their white counterparts. And so we think that this is one of those rare instances where you can 
create sustainable business models. You can bring more people into the financial mainstream. It creates greater GDP for the country and the world, quite frankly. And it allows us to move families forward multi-generational from multi-generational wealth perspective. So technology is that linchpin in my mind, and it's a great opportunity to, to, to create uh, a situation where everybody wins. I'm just glad to be a part of that. Thank you, Wole. Allison? Uh, hello, Th thank you so much again for having me here too. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'm a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, but um, before that, uh, I am originally as an economist or retirement economist who studies life cycle finance and all the different ways people can build wealth. And over the years I've worked in policy, international organizations and in financial industry and as a journalist doing some unusual things. So for me, it's not just about having good ideas about how to understand uh, wealth creation over the life cycle, but how to communicate them in ways that people connect with and find inspiring. And to answer your question, I, I feel like it, it's just, you know, it's so obviously important. I mean, not only is it better for individuals to um, have a more inclusive society, it's more fair, it's more just, but also it's just better for everyone. I mean, I think amongst the many financial issues we're having right now is a lack of dynamism in the economy and finding a way to get more people involved in terms of healthy risk taking, in terms of saving and exploring different assets and even contributing in entrepreneurship, which a lot of people are really shut out of right now, I think as well is really the key to our economic success as a country and as a whole. So not only, as I said, is it more just, but I think it's definitely gonna be a high tide races all boats situation. Great, thank, thank you, Allison. Mark? Nice to be here, Ray. Thanks for the invitation. And um, I think I'd like to start, start at the end here. So today I'm a professor at an Ivy League institution. Prior to this, I worked at Johns Hopkins. I did my graduate work at Columbia. But where did I come from? You hear this accent, it's a Scottish accent. I grew up in a town called Dundee on the east coast of Scotland. It basically is the Flint, Michigan of, of Scotland. We, we specialized in unemployment. Uh, no one in my family went to college. Nobody in my family ever owned their own home. There were occasional sort of periods where income was around, but the words wealth never came out of our mouths. We didn't understand it. No one in our neighborhoods had anything. The ability to own assets over the long term, to derive an income from those assets, the importance of compound interest saving, getting out of zero interest savings account, taking risks so that you can build wealth over the long term, is simply a language that was incredible in the sense that we just didn't hear it, understand it, et cetera. So as I went to university and as I became interested in finance, amongst other things, this whole world opened up to me that kind of explained, oh, that's why the world looks like this. Some people have these assets and most people don't. So surely a really simple place to start would be broaden the distribution of those assets and allow people to experience the real gains that happen across in so many different dimensions through the ownership of assets when they're broadly distributed. Great. Well, I'm already inspired. You all have amazing stories about how you got into this work and being really different and complementary perspectives. So um, I want to each of you talk about uh, risk taking um, in, in some way, uh, some directly in terms of how families should manage their risk or, um, you know, the way we need to, uh, you know, build uh, portfolios that have a little bit more risk in them. Some of you talk about the risk of inaction. So um, I'd, like, I'd like you to talk a little bit about this notion of risk. You know, Wole, you talk about the risk of financial exclusion, you know, why we must uh, address that risk if we want to close the racial wealth gap. Alice, can you talk about the risk of not investing or only saving in safer, less risky assets? And Mark, you talk about the risk of being left out of equity markets, you know, and the many costs of that to uh, lower income families. So. Just the real question here is why is risk taking um, essential to building wealth? You know, why is that? Why is that an essential feature of building building wealth over the long term? Uh, let's go backwards. Uh, Mark, we'll start with you, then Allison, and then Wally. Well, Allison's essay is actually really on point for this. Are you sure you don't want to start with Allison for this one? Because that's kind of what she wrote about. Then I'm happy to go after. 
Sure, that's fine. We'll start at the household level and then we'll move up to the more macro. Oh, thank you. And I just want to share, I also have an undergraduate Scottish degree, although I'm not Scottish. I always wish I was. <laughs> and also went to Columbia for grad school. So oh, wow. uh, <laughs> we're twins, who knew? Yeah, almost. Um, alas, I said I'm not actually Scottish, but I always wished I was. Um, so, uh, but thank you. So, I, I mean, he, you know, risk is how wealth grows. No one's ever gotten rich unless they've saved absolutely everything they have, um, not taking risk. <clears throat> if you take risk, you have on average a higher return. So your wealth is just going to grow faster, which is why, you know, I don't think it's realistic to expect uh, more wealth accumulation when we um, are going to effectively have shut out large swaths of our population from um, equity markets. Um, that is probably the best way to grow wealth. We talked a lot about housing in the past and housing also traditionally has been um an important part of wealth accumulation, but it's not enough. And honestly, it leaves households more exposed as we saw in the last financial crisis because their portfolios are fairly concentrated in housing, particularly uh, lower wealth people. So getting people more into equity, which is, as I said, has risks, and we're gonna discuss, Mark has a way, I have a way of mitigating that risk to individuals, is the only way they're gonna grow meaningful wealth in a diversified way. Because diversification, you know, from finance, is the best way to take risk because you know risk always comes with the um, sort of possibility of loss. But when you diversify, you get more risk for your buck in terms of minimizing loss. So getting people in equity, particularly well diversified index funds, really is uh, sort of the most diversified way to grow risk without taking any more risk than you need to. So Allison, let, let's stay with this for a second because a lot of the families that we're talking about grew up like Mark. Mm -hmm. Wealth is a foreign term. It seems inaccessible to them. And so in, in your essay, you say that policymakers face two challenges, increasing stock market participation for lower resource families, and then some way to protect lower earners from large risks. What are, you, what are your responses to those two particular challenges? Well, that is the challenge. And that's why traditionally there has been, when we've had programs to um, encourage lower earners to have wealth, when your earlier panelists talked about that, they were always steered into bonds. The idea is that, you know, because you have less wealth, you know, you or and sort of are probably living paycheck to paycheck, you can't really afford to lose money. And that's, I think, sort of why I think we've traditionally put people in safe assets, but the problem is, is they missed out on a lot of important wealth creation. And to be fair, as I said, if you do, if you know the stock market's down and you're low income, you have a higher risk of job loss. I mean, they, lower income people tend to work in more variable industries. So to lose your job and then have all of your savings wiped out in the stock market, like it's, it's a very serious concern. But there are other things we can do. Uh, one thing I talk about uh, is put options, you know, which is effectively insurance, which could put a floor on how much loss people have. Right now, often when we do have savings plans that encourage low income savers, we give them higher than average um, risk-free returns or higher than market risk-free returns. And that costs the government money. But you wonder if the government would be money would be better spent again giving people a floor on risky assets so they can get the upside but have less downside risk at the same time fascinating thank you yeah you know this idea of family wealth insurance is something that Ida and I talked about and rethinking the safety net to also include uh, wealth is a really fascinating idea now mark you um you know you recognize that uh, inevitably there's risks in the stock market that goes up and down. Yet you and you and uh, Eric in your essay say that there's actually an upside to a financial crisis that could benefit low wealth families. What, what exactly are you? Uh, what, what's your proposal here? It's really fascinating. Yeah, it's a, it's a bizarre way to think about it, but it's true. There's an upside to financial crises, believe it or not, and it's the upside to the government. Basically, what happens every time there's a financial crisis is that people who hold equities say, at least in the models that we use, that, oh, it looks like the earnings of those companies are gonna go down because there's a big recession, everyone's freaked out, so you dump the equities. And then you want to buy something safe. Well, the issue of the safe assets is the government, bonds. So basically what happens is bonds basically rally at the time the stocks get dumped. 
Now, what that means, because bond prices and, and uh, interest rates move inversely, is that the government's cost of issuing debt basically becomes negative because everybody wants to hold bonds, nobody wants to hold equities. Now, we've been through the cycle in 2008, we got it again with COVID, we're probably going to see it again in the future. And what happens just now is we get a form of public insurance, which, as Alison describes, is really inefficient and really expensive. It's called the, the, the uh, central bank walks in and basically does quantitative easing and other such things. And what that does is it pushes asset prices back up, makes people feel a little bit better, it stabilizes markets. It also massively increases inequality because it's a free gimme to people who already have those assets. So how do we weaponize this to make it to work for everyone else? Well, when those equities fall, why not basically kind of get a fidelity for the people? That is to say a giant investment fund modeled after the type of sovereign wealth funds you get in places like Norway. And you issue 20% of debt and bonds at a negative rate, which means that your cost of capital is below zero. You then buy all those discounted equities. You're not trying to control the companies. You're taking a very sort of conservative approach. You never hold more than, let's say, 5% of any particular issuance. And you build a huge diversified portfolio of truly global equities. And then you just lock it up. This time, you get compounding at 5%, the equity premium. It will go up and down over time. But a quick back of the envelope calculation would give you this. 20% of US GDP is about $4 trillion. $4 trillion in equities bought at a discount of 50%, compounded for five years, will give you about two, about $4 trillion back, right? Mm. So what would you do with four, well, actually about 3.4 trillion. What would you do with them? Well, you could basically wipe out all the student loans in the country. Right. You, you could fund huge amounts of decarbonization. You could modernize the grid. You could do whatever you wanted. None of that has come from taxes. All of that has come from investment, diversified ownership that is held in trust for the people, the 80 percent that don't have assets. The premiums from this once generated, if you don't want to spend it wiping out student loans or whatever, they could be treated, if you will, as endowments. After all, why should the rich be the only people that get inheritances as endowments? And when you're 21, you could pool your assets with your friends, start a business, offset education costs, offset training. And again, none of this is taking from someone and giving to someone else. It is growing it together. It is turning an opportunity, turning a crisis into an opportunity. Fascinating. All right, both of you ex have expanded our thinking, talking about put options, talking about the government actually getting involved in equity markets, uh, new ways to insure risk. I think that's fascinating. Wole, um, you know, in your essay, you talk about the, the real cost of financial exclusion. And but if we were to achieve financial inclusion, how could you know how could that really address the racial wealth gap? Yeah, so I think um, you know, as you said earlier, and teeing up the question, the greatest risk is not taking one. And I think actually, as as I think about it, it's a little bit from a policy perspective in terms of and and also just creating new models. And, and I say that because, you know, if you look at the, um, we all know the statistics in terms of the percentage of uh, wealth in the black community versus the white counterpart, it's 10%. You can, you can go as five to 15%, depending on the source. Um, you have a smaller rate of home ownership in the black community today than you did at the time that the Fair Housing Act was put into place. And just know that, that, that those kinds of statistics means that the, um, the gap in terms of creating uh, a level playing field for people is, is, is at best staying static and at worst it's widening. And so to the extent that we are able to provide a way for people to do the traditional routes of homeowner, uh, traditional routes of creating wealth, right? Whether it's, in my mind, it's home ownership, it's uh, entrepreneurship, it's um, eliminating or reducing the burden of student debt. You know, eliminating the, the ability of student debt, for example, gives someone with a freshly minted degree the ability to um, maybe make different kinds of choices. Uh, in, in terms of their career, or it allows them to make different kinds of choices in terms of um, starting a business or buying a home. And I think that's really the crux of it. And I think if for those who are in a position to, with excess capital, to be able to put money in the, in the stock market, that's terrific. Um, but others, and you also have to take in cultural um, 
cultural uh, norms, if you will, in terms of how people perceive access to or how they can create wealth in the African American community it's, it's, historically has been through home ownership or entrepreneurship. Um, so anyway, to the extent that we have just getting people banked, right, can create $40,000 of avoided fees, some of the analysis would suggest. And if imagine if someone had, over the course of a working person's lifetime, if you look at check cashing fees, if you look at overdraft fees, if you accumulate that over a working person's life in the African American community, it's 40,000 bucks. So you, you can do a lot actually with $40,000 and that then gives you the ability to have um, different kinds of outcomes where you can leave, you can live the life you'd like to lead and then leave something for the next generation, which I think is so important. So anyway, it's really in my mind, a situation where let's move people away from extractive services and put folks into products and services that are additive and then it gives you the ability to take risk. Um, but we think we need new models in terms of whether it's what we're trying to do as a company or others like us, whether it's large firms reimagining partnerships with um, emerging technology firms so we can, we can create products and services that make sense for the entire pyramid. And again, I think what's fun is everybody wins because we're creating value for all aspects of the community. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, let me just ask you very briefly. So you do, do you, you see a real positive constructive role for technology and helping struggling families build wealth? Absolutely. I mean, I think technology in my mind is an enabler, right? And um, we know that the way I think about the world, at least, is technology has been used. And so, so first of all, all financial services companies are technology companies. Um, I, I think fintech has just become a, a, a term of art for startups, but if the largest companies to the smallest companies are all trying to become more efficient and innovative using technology to run their businesses. And so some people have been able to use technology to solve problems like, hey, I want to refinance you know, the student debt of students at Brown University uh, or Stanford, and they call that SoFi, right? And that and other things like them. And so far, it's a great company, but they've, they're, they're looking to solve first world problems. And then technology has been used in innovative ways in emerging markets. And we'll take a great example of what's happened in Kenya and in Pesa in terms of sort of skipping over the brick and mortar infrastructure build for communities that had uh, very nascent financial services infrastructure to create one of the most sophisticated ones. But technology hasn't been used in my mind, to solve the problem of the home healthcare worker or the, the bus driver? Um, and how do we then make it possible for those individuals, I'll call those second world problems, to be able to build credit in a way that reflects who they are, enable them to purchase homes that have appropriately priced credit, to make the credit invisible, visible. Um, and I think that's where the opportunity is to use technology in a way that, that, that moves us forward. Fascinating, yeah, thank you, I, I, I appreciate that. Mark, can you say just a little bit about how your proposal differs from established sovereign wealth funds? What's, what, you know, what's unique about your proposal? Uh, there's lots unique, but one way to think about it is most of these ones that exist just now are funded by, in the case of the Middle Eastern ones, carbon rents that come off of oil. Even the Norwegian one basically turned the oil into cash and cash into equities. What we're essentially doing is just taking advantage of the government's cost of capital in a crisis to buy assets that are already out there and then take the upside of that and share that in a much more equitable way. Uh, to go back to that example that I gave, if you issued four trillion in bonds and you get 3.4 trillion on the upside, say 10 years later, push it out a little bit, 15 if you want, you're not actually saying, hey, you just spent four and you got four back. You still have the four as your base because you've swapped debt for equity. The net asset position of the, of the state is actually unchanged. So everything is upside. So rather than being a kind of state finance vehicle that comes off of carbon rents or something like this, which is kept away as a rainy day fund, I really see this as a kind of active uh, part of the state 
the really miles away from Congress, no politicians anywhere near it, not even the central bankers near it, right? Basically got a totally independent board and have this as a mandate to generate wealth for those 80% of Americans that are currently outside of the wealth creation circuits. And I think it would be very powerful indeed. Yeah, very exciting. You know what? what what's uh, really remarkable here is that you're talking about a form of wealth creation that nobody's even thought about. Yakov is seeing wealth being created in a different sector and trying to capture that. We have another essay looking at corporate consolidation and you know the, the wealth that could accrue to working families if we thought about that differently. Uh, Peter Barnes and uh, talks about social inheritance. You know, the, the wealth is all around us. It's just not being recognized as such, being captured and being distributed, or and there aren't enough opportunities for real people in real communities like the one you grew up in. Mark, to create that wealth. Um, Allison, um, you, you talk about 529s in, in your essay, and I'm just curious, you know, can, can some of these existing products and systems like 401ks and 529s, you know, be an avenue for the kind of wealth creation that you're talking about? And I'm curious, is there a financial education or financial literacy component that would need to go along with your proposal? I mean, to some extent, I think, especially when it comes to risk taking, it makes a lot more sense to take risk in longer term assets rather than a rainy day fund. So mm -hmm. I think 529s and 401ks and other types of retirement accounts are a good place to start with this. And to some degree, you do need some financial education, especially if you're starting to get into put options, but not as much as you might think. I think mm -hmm. um, a big um, win we've had actually in terms of diversifying stock ownership has actually occurred in the last 15 years and almost like people didn't even notice. One of my uh, dissertation papers in 2006 was looking at survey consumer finances and how people with different 401k uh, plans from different racial and ethnic groups invested them. And there were huge disparities. Black Americans were far less likely to invest their 401k in any sort of stock. And this is, you know, controlling for education and wealth and obviously market access because everyone in a 401k is market access. But if you look at more recent um, survey consumer finance data, a lot of that gap has completely disappeared. And that really came from um, the sort of automatic enrollment where everyone was just automatically invested in stock. That's done a lot to, to close that gap. So I think there's a lot we can do in these accounts. And as I said, this has been a big win for financial inclusion. And I mean, still not enough because a lot of minority groups still don't have 401ks at all. And that's a huge issue. But for those who do, it's really been, as I said, a great victory that I don't think we've celebrated enough and shows how much potential there is for these accounts, particularly if we can make them more accessible to more people to really sort of increase inclusion. Thank you. Yeah. As I mentioned before, I'm a huge fan of 529s at birth and 401ks. Once you start working, I think there's a lot we can do with defaults, including a default investment option, which would really go a long way here. So uh, last question for each of you, just what, you know, why, why, why are you, why were you eager to, to, to contribute to this book? You know, what, what do you see the potential here is? Um, Allison, Mark, and then Wolai. Well, as I said, you know, wealth accumulation and uh, retirement have been what I've worked on my whole career. And uh, as a financial economist, I've always been interested in risk. And I'm getting very concerned that we're sort of discouraging more risk taking. And I really see that as a great means for prosperity for all, particularly we're shutting more and more people out of meaningful risk taking. So when you mentioned the possibility of broader financial inclusion and wealth creation, I just was immediately wanted to be involved. Thank you. Mark? So for me, if I had to sum it up, it would be this. Assets are great because they generate income and they give you security, et cetera. But assets are also about ownership. And ownership is about a sense of belonging and a sense of community. When you have economies across the world which are increasingly divided politically, but also divided in terms of who owns the stuff that matters, then you are basically fragilizing your society. So I think that having much broader asset ownership and allowing people to enjoy the upside of assets. And as Alison says, also take part in the risk taking that goes with it and understand that and build that into their life portfolios. That's something that strengthens our societies as well as our economies. Something that you've written a lot about is this intersection between property ownership and democracy, uh, a really essential point here. And of course, it's, it's, an, uh, it's an idea that goes back to the founding of the nation that these two things are highly related and I think we, we simply have to restore that notion of property ownership as a means for a better society and a better democracy. Wole, why'd you say yes when I called? 
Um, well, you know, I think it, it, it really is just picking up on, on the points made. For me, I believe that creating a equitable society where people have the opportunity to uh, compete fairly and equally with others is one of the big issues of our time. And um, if we want this great experiment um, in this country to continue on for the next uh, several hundred years, we got to figure this out. And um, to be a part of the conversation, don't have all the answers, but we've got a lot of good ideas. And to be in a place where I could add my two cents to the conversation and be inspired by the people on this panel, um, by the Fed and Aspen and everyone else who contributed to the book, you know, it was a real opportunity for me to, um, to, to be a part of moving this important dialogue forward. Because I, I think if we don't figure this out, um, we will have a society that we might not really be very proud of uh, in the next uh, several decades. So I'm just pleased to be a part of it as we try to move this forward. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I just want to point out again, this is a sample of the innovative thinking that we're trying to highlight in this book. Please read the book, engage, engage in the conversation. And with that, we will close this panel. And uh, Allison, Mark, and Wole, you can all sign off. Thanks again. Thanks. Hi again, Ray. Hey, Ida. How are you doing? I'm good. It's up to us to, to wrap this up. Weren't those conversations fascinating? Yeah, I think they were. It, they made me, uh, I, wanna, I, I wrote a three-point list that I want to kind of, we're going to wrap up here. We're not going to take too long, but there are three things I think feel like, uh, as I got the chance to think while you were talking, uh, I wanted to bring up to people. One was, you know, we really did reach broadly across ideological perspectives, across a lot of different um, silos, if you will, and you say a lot more about that. We don't agree. Uh, we don't expect everybody on the stage to agree. And I think at this moment in our country's history, it's not about agreeing. It's about having the courage and understanding the necessity of having the conversation anyway and getting it all in the room and learning how to have the most robust conversation uh, possible and bring the most robust data to what's gonna work. So I think that was per point one. Number one or two was we really, and you can say more about this, we really leaned into wealth creation in this book. We looked at the kinds of solutions that were I often have been saying lately, uh, there is a whole other set of conversations about what it's gonna take to close the wealth gap uh, because we know that the runaway wealth creation happening in the 0.01% is a whole different set of solutions around dealing with wealth inequality, um, dealing with the top, uh, what's driving wealth growth at the top, then about what is going to help with wealth creation for that bottom 80%. So, so we know that there's a much bigger set of conversations and we will be having them. But this book focuses a lot on what we can do about wealth creation. And the final thing I'd say and that I wanna throw it over to you to react and respond and wrap up is uh, none of this um, would have been possible for the Aspen Institute side of things uh, without uh, incredibly generous uh, funders who trust us uh, and, and we're excited about us doing something quite emergent um, and uh, we're, it's a bit of a stone soup conversation here. We think there's demand for the big tent conversation. So I just wanted to make personally call out the City Foundation for funding us to create the website, do the work. I wanna thank the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth for helping us uh, have the staff available and the capacity to put on the event. Uh, I wanna thank JP Morgan Chase uh, Foundation as well for their support of a lot of our work on debt and as relation to wealth. And then finally, I wanna thank Prudential Foundation uh, who really from the get-go has helped us think and be ambitious about a future of wealth conversation. So I wanna thank all of them um, for the ways that they've been able to support the Aspen Institute. We have big ambitions for this work. So certainly that doesn't have to round out the tent of uh, funders in, in the world that are, that are working with us. We welcome everybody to come into this conversation with us. And I wanna throw it to you to give any response to that and also to wrap up with your own thoughts. Oh, I'll keep it brief, Ida. Just once again, uh, thrilled with the partnership with, with the Aspen Institute, the opportunity to think together, to put a book together, and especially to carry this discussion forward. Um, we don't have funders here to thank at the Fed, but we do have a lot of folks here at the Fed who made this book possible. Too many to name, they're all called out in the book. This was a true team effort here at the Fed, 
and starting from Jim Bullard on down, the support was really incredible. And um, I, I couldn't thank uh, everybody in, this, in the Fed who made this book possible. And again, we are so excited about the conversation. Look forward to your engagement on the blog, the website, the roadshow, everything to come. So thank you, everybody. And uh, are we done? I think we'll I think we'll make We're it around the 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 um uh the, the the download for the book is futureofwealth.org. We will be making more live pages on that website over time. All of the past events we've been doing in this future of wealth portfolio, the book launch with Dorothy Brown a few weeks, uh, uh, the retirement and racial equity conversations, all of that will be available. We'll also start to try to make it a bit of a calendar for what are the things coming up in the future. And there's quite a few of our own and uh, quite a few of our, um, our partners uh, and uh, that, are, that are having and teeing up conversations in the future. So please reach out to us. Uh, the idea here is that we will certainly do more with the essays that are here. And for every one person we had in this book, there's three more that I'm really eager to talk to and make sure that their ideas are heard. So, uh, so Ray, I think we do have a to-do list going forward. We have a to-do list. We have a lot of author authors we're gonna be featuring going forward. And uh, thank everybody for your time today and your engagement. And we look forward to the discussion going forward. Take care, everybody. Everybody. Bye-bye.